Hi, everyone. My name is Hema Paramara. I cover hedge funds at Bloomberg News. And I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Chris Solars, Jackie Rosner, and Eric Bender. And um, as we were introduced, our topic today, the hedge fund conundrum. Why are funds struggling? Why are they not um, beating the indices? And what can they do to get better? So really, the first question kind of writes itself. Um, you know, we, we see the S&P up 20%, more than 20% so far this year. Hedge funds up about five. Um, it's not new. We've seen them struggling to beat the indices for a number of years. Uh, why do you think that is? Why are so many hedge funds struggling? Chris, we can start with you. Sure. Hello, is this on? Um, well, hello, everyone, and, and thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so this is, this certainly is a conundrum. Um, we are at an all-time high of $3.3 trillion in the hedge fund um, in the hedge fund world, yet performance over the last five years, and particularly the past decade, have been very underwhelming. Um, probably the biggest reason is that we have been in a nearly runaway bear market for, for the past decade. And in a bear, in a, sorry, a bull market, in a bull market, you want to be with passive. You don't want to pay an extra layer of fees and you want to be long biased. So most passive managers have outperformed active managers. However, when it turns and we're in a bear market environment, you probably want to be with active managers. Um, but I would say five years ago, a lot of our clients were asking us, um, you know, about their underperforming hedge fund portfolio. Um, and a lot of what was happening was making slight changes and tweaks. And the conversation today, or t today is slightly different. I think around the hedge fund allocator community is why should we keep hedge funds? because they have underperformed. And I saw about five years ago, there was a little bit of a change in the sense that um, I think since 2015, there have been more hedge fund closures than starts. Since over the past four years, there have been net outflows um, nearly every quarter. 12, of the, 12 out of the last 16 quarters have seen net outflows, an aggregate of over 150 billion. So even though we're at 3.3 trillion, the all-time high of, of hedge fund assets right now, under the hood, it's not looking quite as rosy. Um, so one reason, um, I think, is simply the number of hedge funds um, in the space. It's a very, very crowded environment. We have over 10,000 hedge funds. And if you go back 30 years to the start of HFRI index um, in 1990, and in a lot of ways, that's the beginning of the institutionalization of the hedge fund asset class, you had just $40 billion dollars across 500 managers, and now you have 3.3 trillion across 10,000 managers. So it's very, very difficult. All the low-hanging fruit is kind of arbed away, and you have to be the very, very best to really thrive today. So overcrowding, one very important reason. Jackie, what else? It's, it's multi-thronged. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Jackie Rosner. Um, before I answer that, I want to say um, oh, happy Veterans Day, everyone. I want to also give a big thanks to VDAC for organizing such a great event. Um, I looked up, by the way, a little trivia about the cutting room. One of the co-founders is uh, the famous actor Christopher Noth, who was on uh, Sex and the City, played the character Mr. Big. Well, today, as far as hedge fund conferences and events goes and getting people together, VDAC is our Mr. Big, so you know, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to say about the challenges, yeah. About the challenges about what's going on, with um, competing against passive and why have hedge funds been challenged? Following on Chris's comments, it's been such a challenging environment for active management. When you think of uh, what the last 10 years in the world of QE has done with low real rates and uh, cons low constrained volatility, it's just forced so much money into passive long only strategies. And the strategies that, uh, as you know, has done very well are the ones that have not gotten shaken out because um, drawdowns have been very limited and the longer hold, the better. And um, in the limit, these passive strategies, which are slower trading and long <coughs> hold biased, uh, in the limit, they tend to be buy and hold. So it's a really a whole question about, uh, we, we all know we're you know, trying to achieve high absolute returns, but it's all a question of alpha or beta. Now the easy money has been the beta. The harder money has been in capturing the alpha. Now, for the most part, uh, easier alpha is made on the long side. 
you know, so it's just, uh, it's just, if anything, you know, it's harder to short things. And uh, shorts tend to be very short-lived, especially in the last, you know, 10 plus years. And so that's been the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is uh, competing against equities. And if you have the choice, if you don't have to invest in hedge funds, the better choice would have been to be in uh, equities. But we see what's happening so many years later, everyone's being even more and more concerned about the equity bait in their portfolio. So, you know, there are all these reasons to be concerned because, you know, this global expansion has been going on way over 10 years. Uh, we know it's been artificially, you know, uh, with these huge tailwinds of low real rates, and people are getting more and more concerned about, you know, what happens if and when rates ever reprice. So uh, the challenges are real. Um, is it fair to compare hedge funds to S&P? Maybe. There, there's many different benchmarks. Everyone has different benchmarks for different reasons. But in terms of absolute returns, that is a question people ask. You know, why do they need alpha in an easy beta environment? But as, the, as people get more concerned, then people really need to, you know, remind themselves the whole purpose, the whole value proposition of why hedge funds uh, do exist. Yeah. Um, you touched on an interesting point, uh, whether or not hedge funds should even be compared to the S&P. We write about hedge funds. We, use, we oftentimes do compare them to the, to the S&P at Bloomberg. We also do compare them to hedge funds and then the specific strategy that they're trading. But we do get you know, people saying, well, the S&P is not really a fair comparison. Um, Eric, where do you kind of stand on that? So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I agree. I would like to maybe challenge the premise of, uh, of the topic, which is that uh, the metric to uh, evaluate hedge fund or the suggestion that hedge funds are not uh, doing well or failing is because they haven't uh, kept up with the S&P this year over the last couple of years. The word hedge or hedge funds comes from the notion that they're supposed to be hedged, they're supposed to be uh, neutral to market risk. Many of them are not, and uh, there's some reason why. But um, to me, first and foremost, uh, comparing hedge fund to um, any standard market index is just um, inappropriate. They're not expected, and they shouldn't be outperforming those indices when those indices are rallying. They should be uh, hopefully doing better when those indices are declining, uh, if they're really hedged. But that's, that's one point. Uh, and then, of course, this leads to the question of what is the real benchmark or what, um, what is the appropriate way to evaluate them. But um, a second point I'd like to make is that we uh, speak of hedge funds as one monolithic group, and they're really not. There are many types of strategies. If you look at um, equity market neutral and you look at um, merger arbitrage and you look at um, a distressed, uh, very different, uh, very different types of risk, very different, different types of leverage very different types of sensitivity to market condition. We can just lump them all together. On top of it, there are, of course, different um, qualities of hedge fund managers. So even within a certain strategy, some of them are very good and some of them are less good. Another point I'd like to make, which I think is important uh, when we talk about the AUM of hedge fund, the distribution of AUM is incredibly skewed among hedge fund. So looking at the number of hedge fund as, um, I would say, as a proxy, is, uh, is again, could be somewhat misleading because if you think of the distribution of the size, it's incredibly concentrated among a relatively small, larger, um, uh, small number of very, very large funds, and we all know them, there's no need to mention names, and then there is this very, very, very um, long tail of a very large number of very small hedge funds that are uh, struggling or just young and maybe one day will, will make it. But again, the distribution is very, very um, uh, skewed, there's the big funds, the established funds, those with the track record and the infrastructure and so on, and there is a very large number of very small funds that uh, are really a very different kind of, uh, of, of animal, at least at, um, at, uh, at this point. No, I think that's a good point. Um, Chris, I wanted to get your thoughts on the question of using the S&P to compare hedge funds against. Yeah, I, I, I would love to take the other side of this argument, Eric. Um, I think what it boils down to, you're, you are in essentially arguing for manager selection and asset allocation within hedge funds, and not all the hedge funds are the same. But when I see the aggregate of hedge funds, when you look at like the HFRI composite index, that's all of the hedge funds up together, and you see that they're up 5 or 6% for the year, and the S&P is up 20 
or S&P total return is up 25. So you're getting maybe one third of the up, upside, yet in the fourth quarter, you got 50% of the downside. And in May and August this year, hedge funds were down. So a lot of them haven't done their job of actually hedging. Um, so I think that's where the backlash against hedge funds underperforming um, the media in general um, ha hasn't liked hedge funds for, for many years for this extra layer of fees. And we've seen this other theme, which is the rise of the low fee um, hedge fund light products. And I think this is in response to this underwhelming alpha production, which actually ties back to the first question, is it just so hard for consistent outperformance? Um, I think one, maybe to state the obvious, the, the very fact that we've had quantitative easing and we've pu pulled aggregate demand forward and we've seen this asset price inflation across the world and we have $12 trillion of negative interest rates today, there's just been this reach for yield. Um, it's also made it harder for hedge funds simply by the fact that many of them, if they're quant managers, they might have 80% in, in, in cash. That in 2006 and seven, that used to yield 5% over the past five years, it was largely zero. So, you know, they're leaving arguably four or 5% on the table there. And that could have been the difference between a positive and a negative year. So it's almost hard to compare 20 years ago to the last 10 years, but in, in aggregate, when we are looking at these indices, I feel like this is the, and, you know, this is the whole index. Um, and somebody is losing investing in hedge funds, maybe not everybody, but in aggregate, I, I feel for the, the LPs who are, who are often talking about not getting their share and the hedge funds are, are not do, pulling their weight in this current environment. So I would, um, it, I'm not disagreeing with you, right? Um, what I'm trying to say is first, I think it's very important to frame the question. Um, I wouldn't again use those indices as the, the benchmark of whether hedge funds are doing the job or not and whether investors um, are getting the money worth. I, uh, I agree with you. There's some challenges, there's some issues. I just wouldn't um, judge them by, by that metric. In fact, in some sense, I would argue that it's maybe even um, uh, allocators into hedge fund that are of, uh, to be blamed to some extent because it's exactly those kind of questions that make some hedge fund gravitate toward taking risk that they wouldn't take otherwise taking market exposure that they shouldn't be taking because at the end of the day, when their uh, investors come to them and ask them, uh, how come you're just generating five or 6% and S&P was up 20, they can do two things. One is to give them this more, um, uh, maybe those lo longer type of discussion about being hedged and uh, looking at the entire cycle and looking for the long term. Uh, but if this doesn't work, uh, they're kind of uh, being, um, being um, um, pushed or they're being cornered and they need to take more risk and they need to take this type of beta exposure to the market that again, they, they're not um, paid for that. Uh, they shouldn't be doing, but they're doing it because they, um, they want to be um, uh, kind of, um, they, they want to be able to satisfy their investors ultimately. I think one of the main problems though is that there's a lot of beta masqueraded as alpha. So they're up 6%, but if the market wasn't up 20%, I don't know if many of them would be up on an absolute basis. So I think that's part of the problem is, is when you see the crisis periods, when the hedge is needed, sometimes it's not there. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's the, probably the most, the biggest disappointment that hedge fund allocators have is that the purpose of having hedge funds is to serve as a uh, diversifier to risk. And it's in those few risk off periods that hedge funds do need to perform. And of course, I'm using a very broad definition, I'm saying hedge funds, are clearly you've got the positively convex strategies, negatively convex strategies, but um, that's the disappointment. Uh, and actually following what Eric said um, about paying hedge fund fees for beta, um, it is also disappointing because ideally over a cycle, you know, you, you would want it to be um, beta agnostic, you know, and the alpha really comes from knowing when to be long beta, when to be short beta, but not to pay someone to be long beta that you could get uh, yourself. So I think that is the, um, the biggest uh, challenge. And it, it's actually also stepping back, uh, talking about the whole concept of absolute returns, uh, that is the number one objective, what, what all investors have in mind. Everyone has different constraints, different sub-objectives, but the main objective is to make money. And, and sometimes, you know, some environments call for some, th some things versus the other. 
when, when a hedge fund manager comes to us and says, oh, you know, we're, we have uncorrelated returns, I usually like to stop them right there and say, well, wait a minute, you know, s and is up, you know, 23, 25% this year. This is not the year that you want to be uncorrelated. Like, that is not, like, the best marketing point. It's okay to be correlated, you know, in up markets. It's important, you know, not to be correlated in down markets. So, um, but our number one objective is uh, absolute returns. And, uh, and then you have to dig deep within hedge fund strategies, you know, uh, which environments are more conducive for others. Uh, for a number of strategies, like a lot of the fundamental value-oriented strategies, managers are always, by definition, long or longer. Equity long-short managers have positive nets. They run at, you know, really usually two speeds, long or longer. Uh, credit, it's also long. Uh, event, it's long. So it's just, uh, other than the extreme case of short bias, you know, you've got just the, the limited set of like the positively convex strategies like macro or CTAs that tend to be um, zero beta over a cycle. So always it's important, you know, to know what you're getting, to tilt your portfolio, you know, based on your views. But what's interesting is that, you know, the inflection point, we're reaching the inflection point more and more the longer we've been in this uh, easy money world. And uh, things, most likely, one thing that most people agree with is that things are going to get more exciting uh, forward. Yeah. Um, I actually did an interview, two interviews last week, one with a CIO of a sovereign wealth fund and another with um, a pension, the, the head of hedge fund strategies at a pension. Both of them were, um, to the point of your inflection point, you know, both were expecting uh, concerns moving ahead, they were seeing red flags, they were positioning more defensively, which for them meant um, increasing their allocation to hedge funds. I'm curious where you guys stand on, as you look forward, um, how that plays into asset allocation on your hedge fund side, but also what, what you see as you talk to your clients. Eric, we can start with you if you want. Yeah, so I think um, the, um, what you echoed is uh, what I hear from, uh, from our clients as well, uh, which is kind of the, um, the other side of, um, of um, the, the argument I was making about not looking at an up market as the right benchmark. Hedge fund should really be um, looked at when uh, the market is down. When, when you're in a period where hedge funds are supposed to benefit you, and then of course some do and some don't, and um, we have been in a very, very bullish environment over the last 10 years or even a little bit more since the uh, great reversal after the financial crisis. So hedge fund didn't really have a chance to, uh, to shine, so to speak, given the, the, given the environment and have, have lagged. Um, and, and the way it seems, and I think Vidak, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, referred to that a little bit with all those uncertainties and challenges we have, definitely it seems that the environment is going to change and therefore hedge fund would, uh, would have uh, uh, an opportunity to, uh, to show, showcase their capabilities. Chris, how are you advising your clients as you look forward? Like, could next year be the year for hedge, for hedge funds? Well, um, certainly. Um, what I see, you know, right now we are at an all-time high in equity markets, and it doesn't feel that way. There are so many things brewing. We've got impeachment trials this week. We've got the uncertainty of next year's elections, including if Warren um, takes uh, the presidency, perhaps equity markets will sell off 20 to 30%. Um, we've still got the ongoing Brexit. We've got riots in the streets in, in Hong Kong and in Chile. We've got a lot of uncertainty. It doesn't feel like we are hunky-dory and we're at this uh, continuation of the 45 degree angle that risk assets have gone for the last um, few years. Um, but we do have the Fed on our side. The Fed pivoted last um, earlier this year and started uh, decreasing rates and we feel like the easy money will continue for, for some time. How it all ends, I don't exactly know. But we've never tried to get too cute about, um, about asset allocation. We like to outsource the alpha to our managers bottoms up. Um, I think it's the job of macro managers to really try to time the market. I think it's very, very, very challenging and nearly impossible to do well. So what we've done is we have a roughly 20% um, allocation within our hedge fund buckets. We have about a 20% allocation to the five major hedge fund strategies. And we call them long short equity, long short credit, event driven, market neutral, and macro. Um, and at the margin, we have been, well, over the last few years, maybe three years, we've completely taken down anything that has a, a net bias. We want to be more neutral. The argument that 
the question that a lot of investors are talking about right now is what inning are we in with respect to this economic and financial cycle? And I think the question is, are we in the seventh or eighth or ninth? Nobody's really saying that we're in the early innings. Everyone knows that after 10 years, it's somewhat long in the tooth and it's time to be prepared for um, inevitable healthy recession that um, will happen over, you know, over in, the, in the coming years. So what we've done is not do too much differently except we're very protective. And we have seen an increase in truly orthogonal, idiosyncratic, market neutral type strategies. Um, quant strategies, reinsurance strategies that truly have nothing to do with, um, with financial markets. They'll be very independent and you could easily see a very strong year when we have a weak year in financial markets, for example. So these are some of the, at the margin, what we're doing. But largely, we are keeping our portfolios very constant, and we already feel like we have found some very good managers that are able to make alpha throughout the market cycle. So staying the course for now. Jackie? So our focus is um, all on hedge funds. So we do have um, some rebalancing within hedge funds all the time, but our outlook is always 12, 18 months forward. But one thing that um, we believe in our central case is we still think that uh, rates are low and will remain low. There's not going to be any major repricing in rates, even though we have seen in the last six weeks or so there's been a pressure for rates to uh, be ticking higher. Uh, we don't see like a massive repricing, but we do think there's going to be pockets of volatility. Volatility will, will be higher. We have tilted the portfolio a bit more in favor of the positively convex strategies rather than the negatively convex. So things like, for example, uh, quant equity market neutral as a, as a space has been quite challenged in this, you know, beta on year. When, when S&P is trading like a T-bill, it's just very hard to trade. Uh, things like quant equity has just been challenged as a whole. Uh, things like uh, fixed income relative value, all these like very much big convergence lever strategy. We're just concerned it's just gotten uh, the returns aren't there. But we do think like in a year like this year, for example, uh, discretionary global macro, it's up about 10% in a year where S&P is up, you know, 25%. Uh, this is unheard of. Most people would have thought that uh, things like macro and CTA is up 12% or something. People would have thought, oh, that only works in a risk off year. But this is happening in a risk-on year because it's been a massive bond rally. At one point, you know, from yield high to yield low, bonds rally globally like 100 basis points. So the point is, you know, there are these, you know, interesting pockets of dislocations that happen that's not just, you know, only S&P related. So we do, we have favored uh, positively convex stuff. I mean, there, there's still plenty of opportunities. There's still plenty of dispersion, you know, even within equity long short, but we've taken down that as a space being concerned about the overall equity beta in portfolios, uh, but there's still plenty of opportunities, you know, in structured credit, structured finance, um, and things like this. But I'd say uh, one notable tilt has been more in favor of positive convexity that is more vol friendly, mm -hmm. rather than being in the short vol. Yeah. And, and to your point, there are a number of winners that are out there. We see a lot of, you know, hedge funds sometimes get a bit of a bad rap, but there are a lot of good winners out there. Element, Rentac, Viking, you see some of these funds doing very well, able to charge 40% fees in some, some cases. So what are some funds that we see that are thriving, not just surviving, but actually doing very well? What are they doing that perhaps most other managers are missing? I have uh, one observation on that. One interesting thing that you've seen in the last uh, few years, um, especially in the hedge funds of the multi-manager hedge funds, the platform funds, that have, uh, you know, used to have 30, 40 plus PMs. Uh, they've concentrated the lineup. They've concentrated the uh, risk taking. There is a lot uh, fewer PMs these days at that shop. Sometimes uh, the founder or the lead people take on a bigger amount of uh, portfolio risk than the past. So one interesting observation is that there's nothing wrong with concentration both in concentrating the lineup of people, in, in, and we're doing that as well in our portfolios, uh, concentrating our allocations. Um, just have bigger size allocations with managers, you get in a better partnership with them, you're making higher conviction bets on, on your best athletes. So th that is one observation. People always say, oh, diversification, diversification. Uh, I mean, I get it, but the downside of that argument is sometimes too much diversification could diversify away returns. So there is something to be said about, you know, times to concentrate things. Eric? What are some of the funds that are winning 
doing right. So I wouldn't, um, I would like to comment on any specific names, but one um, one trend that um, I do see is the um, is the use of um, alternative data of machine learning of of new techniques. Um, and um, unlike what some people may um, may think, this is not just limited to quant funds. It's across the board. It's just another tool. Uh, whether the ultimately the investment decision are made systematically or um, or um, uh, in a discretionary fashion, but the use of um, additional additional insight that come from different types of data, and there are many types of data from social media, from geolocation, from credit card, and so on, uh, augmented with some um, with some new technique that allow you to uh, to process this data more effectively and more um, um, in a more speedy fashion. Those all create some insights. Um, it's very challenging because if 30, 40 years ago we were in an environment where you didn't have enough data and really um, the challenge was how to overcome the lack of data to make the right decision. Now the challenge is kind of reversed. You have too much data, it's, um, it's costly to purchase and it's even more costly to process in terms of, um, of, uh, of effort and, and having the right, uh, the right, um, uh, the right uh, kind of capabilities. Nevertheless, you have to do it, otherwise you're, um, you're lagging. So the ability to know um, how to concentrate, which data to use, to do it in the right way, to, uh, to draw the right inferences, not just to um, look at any data as informative, uh, but to understand which data is informative, which data is not informative, that's, that's something that uh, seems to be very important. You know, after every single um, manager meeting that I have, and over the years now I've met with thousands of hedge fund managers, but I write myself a due diligence note, and the most important paragraph is the edge, the edge of the manager. And over the years I've, I've bucketed it into three main ways that you can have an edge. You can have a fundamental edge, a research edge, you can have a trading edge, or you can have a, it's kind of a collect all bucket, but a structuring edge. And I'll, I'll tell you what, what I mean by these. The fundamental edge, I think, is harder and harder to come by. Um, it's really being smarter, being able to look at the same public information and evaluate it better. I think after Reg FD in, two th in the early 2000s, it was very, very clear that it became harder and harder. And now with a level playing field in the internet and with almost even the smallest funds have the same access to some of the same reports, the same sell side research, um, especially with the crowding of the, of, of the hedge fund asset class, it's very hard to have a fundamental edge. I think it's a weaker argument to say, I'm just smarter. We just, we look at public equities with a private equity approach, or, you know, we just do all the deep work. That's a hard edge. It, it's not impossible, but it's, it's very, very small. Um, a trading edge, I think, in the early days of macro trading or in the early days of, of timing, you could talk to managers who would say they just have a, they have ice coursing through their veins and they can just feel the market out. And they know if non-farm non payrolls are down, that the S&P will have this reaction function, gold. They have a little playbook. They put on their, their trade. I think it's very hard to know how the market will react and you no longer see this trading edge because they feel it in their gut. I think a lot of that has gone to high frequency trading who are faster and more nimble than, than the discretionary trader. So the only bucket I feel is left is something like having a real aha edge, like you have access to alternative data. You have access to different types of resources that maybe others don't. So this does give a nod to some of the larger quant managers who have bigger R&D budgets. But it could be as simple as having a structuring edge. You're looking at the options market and you're playing a long short equity, a long short equity fund with an overlay of simply using the options market as a way to trade or in, in some other structuring way. It could be a, a risk management way, or it could be simply that you um, are in an opportunity set that is more fruitful than trying to be a generalist long short equity uh, fund, for example. I'd like to add on the um, talk on the big data. Uh, it's true that the, the large quant funds do have the resources to address that, uh, you know, intelligently and, and properly, because it, it does take a lot of infrastructure to do that right. And there's, you know, it's, it's quite a buzzword a lot. You hear that from a lot of managers, especially quants, but also even some discretionary managers like to talk about their access to these, you know, great data, big data and everything. Uh, but just one interesting observation, you know, big data, if it fits in a spreadsheet, it's not big data. 
you know, if it, it, it takes a lot of, you know, bigger resources and R&D budgets to, to do this right. And when we go in and meet with these managers, we always, you know, we want to see the technology and we get to compare it with what we see with other people. And it's interesting that um, even with the access to this stuff and doing it right in terms of, you know, cleaning the data, execution, risk management, everything, uh, it's still challenging, right? Not everyone with, big data doesn't necessarily imply big returns. And sometimes, I mean, data is just data and it's not information. Sometimes, you know, you see people with uh, fewer data, limited sets, uh, get remarkably different answers from analyzing the same data. So it's an important tool and it, it helps, you know, certainly, but it's certainly, you know, not 100% um, correlated uh, to success. We've seen, you know, a lot of challenges with that. We continue, to, we continue to see people start their own hedge funds in, in this environment. Um, oftentimes we see fundamental, um, fundamental equity hedge funds, bottoms up. Um, if, and, and to your point on what it would take to start a quant fund if you are, have to compete for the access, not just to resources, but to data, to talent. What advice do you have for people that are trying to start a fund or evolve their maybe current fundamental human run fund to include some of the big data machine learning if they're trying to evolve with the times. Um, it, it, it's difficult because you have the challenges of capital, you have the challenge of com competing with the big names. How do you navigate that if you're an early fund? So I think, uh, you know, a few things. Um, one is certainly know your audience because you don't necessarily have to be competing against, you know, the big hedge funds. Uh, certainly, you could be considered as uh, an addition, you know, to a portfolio with one of these other names as well. So, don't view it as a, you know, direct competition. But I think people just need to stick to their core competencies and and understand, you know, what are the barriers of entry specifically for that fund that you're creating, and you know, the alpha you're trying to capture. Who are you capturing it from? You know, so it, it's a bit of an overly ambitious agenda to say I want to, especially to start a quant fund. In this environment, it takes a, it's a much higher bar these days. It's just getting harder and harder. But there will be new quant funds. I mean, that just happens, you know, all the time. But I just say, you know, know what the barriers of entry are. Know what the market segmentation is. Know who you're trying to go after. But don't view it as like a head-on competition to the big ones because uh, that's going to be too challenging. The big ones, as you've pointed out, you know, have attracted a lot of capital. They continue to do so. Um, but, I mean, you know, the market always evolves. Uh, people, new entrants uh, come and go all the time. Um, I think another interesting thing is the use of private equity and private wagers. Like, we've seen some of the newer funds that started up the past few years have a private book, um, and some are making money, or were, maybe not so much now, making money off the back of, like, Jewel or Peloton. Um, I'm curious, if we, as we look at the evolution of this industry, of the hedge fund space, we see more hedge fund private equity. We see more interest. Like, what, how does it look for you, I guess, down the road? Do you want to take that one, Chris? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one thing that's interesting is, as we've seen the commoditization, of, we haven't talked about alternative risk premia, mm -hmm. but what's interesting is, over these last five years, maybe the last eight years, we've really seen a commoditization of certain betas, hedge fund betas. Momentum, value, um, growth, small caps, we see them um, individualized and sold piecemeal. And this, this industry perhaps is 300 billion for alt risk premia and something like six or 700 billion for um, smart beta. So there is a lot of almost competing uh, efforts there. And in a lot of ways, the, the alphas of yesterday are today's smart betas. So one question that's interesting is almost what you're asking is, what are the alphas today that will be commoditized into the future? And I think that's a, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. But one of the, to, to your question specifically, um, we saw this prior to 2008, that a lot of the liquid hedge funds were almost, they were coerced in, in a sense, no, not coerced. They were incentivized to put um, juicier, long-dated returns in their portfolio in a way to keep up with the high returns in the frothiness at the very tail end of the 2006, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. And it had um, adverse effects when a lot of the funds were um, 
far below their high watermark. They had to side pocket. They had to gate investors. And um, it led to a lot of tears because a lot of these privates were illiquid. So this is a, probably a worrying sign if we see an increase in level three assets or an increase in privates within the liquid hedge fund portfolio. So as a consultant, we see, and I think we like to put everything cutely into buckets, in the hedge fund bucket, I think things should be very liquid because ultimately you can redeem it you know, within uh, foreseeable time. You can get your money back. It's your money. When you're investing in private equity, then you're investing for seven to 10 years and you know, you know the game there. But I, I, um, ultimately, we don't like to see um, the rise of privates within hedge fund portfolios. So some, some observation I have is one, uh, we see a convergence, if you will, between hedge funds and more traditional type managers. There's some well-known hedge fund managers that um, have uh, introduced long-only type mandates or um, uh, more kind of traditional or exotic type betas um, to, um, to investors as a way to increase, um, increase kind of the, the offering and maybe to create a more diversified um, business, uh, business proposition. And then there's some long-only managers that have um, internally hedge fund-like um, pools of, of assets that are managed in a, in a way that is, uh, is, uh, is similar to a hedge fund, whether it's to maintain um, talent internally or just to diversify um, and, and be able to access hedge fund-like return in a, in a more economic way. That's one, uh, one, uh, one observation. Another observation um, it has to do with, um, with, um, with the fact that um, this notion that passive investing is necessarily a threat to hedge fund may not be um, totally right. Increase in passive investing means that there is more capital which is invested in a rule-based systematic way. But it, everything which is rule-based means that it's also predictable. And some of this capital is invested in a rule-based way which sometimes is not driven by economic uh, consideration. In other words, if we look at indices, um, both in uh, credit and in equity, there's some behaviors of um, passive um, investment vehicles that follow indices and follow known in advance uh, construction rules, which are not economically driven. And there's a number of, of examples. Um, those behaviors or those inefficiencies can be exploited. They're known in advance. And uh, they actually uh, present opportunities to whoever can take the other side, whether it's in equities, uh, rebalancing and other types of behaviors in, um, in credit uh, downgrades from investment get to high yield and, and so on. We have a lot of those examples that um, can, be, uh, can be taken advantage of. And therefore, again, an increase in passive investing also presents opportunities to active managers, not just hedge fund, but uh, whoever can uh, essentially uh, bypass the, uh, the constraint that uh, rule, fully rule-based type behavior um, is, uh, is presenting. Jackie, do you have thoughts on the use of passive investing? Uh, yeah, so there's certainly nothing wrong with it. Um, it certainly is a very viable tool as a, as a complement. Some people use it as substitutes. Just the important thing is to know what you're getting because a lot of these strategies are um, run by hedge funds, but they're certainly not hedge fund strategies. So. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with it, but just, you know, it's priced accordingly because there's, uh, there's less trading involved, it's, uh, it's less alpha. But again, as long as you know what you're getting into, it's totally fine. And I don't think any of this stuff is going to lead to, like, a big unwind or anything like that, because um, it's not that it's crowded, it's just that it's, um, it's long, these passive things. And um, right now, that, it, that would be the biggest pain trade right now, since uh, stocks that are all-time high, so much money has, has just flooded into bond funds this year. So the biggest pain trade now would be a sell-off in both stocks and bonds. So the passive uh, will have a hiccup. And actually, so will hedge funds too, because they're not a long bias now. So unfortunately, there could be a drawdown before uh, people are reminded, you know, the value proposition of hedge funds, you know. But just another observation, what happens uh, in the search for yield in this environment, in this world of QE, and it forces people into... Uh, returns, uh, people dabble a little bit uh, also on the liquidity spectrum. And sometimes some of these passive things might be, you have to know what you're getting because sometimes you see hedge fund managers dabble with like private credit and things like this. 
and some of these bonds trade by appointment. And uh, the next many pullback in the markets could be another liquidity uh, type event. Uh, not necessarily a big one coming, but just like it, it, you could wake up one day and, you know, stocks could be down 5% because, I mean, they, this could be sparked from some, you know, risk off selling as people are getting out of some liquid. So it's certainly um, just basically know what you're getting, but it certainly is a very valid and viable tool, especially in a world where people are so concerned about fees. I mean, these things are priced accordingly and everyone has a fee budget. You know, it's okay to pay fees for alpha. And it's okay, you know, to have access to some of these passive things that are much lower fees. To, to Jackie's point, one um, additional observation I've seen is the creation of different liquidity um, vehicles among hedge funds. In other words, if you think about the way hedge funds operate, uh, there is a pool of capital by investors, and those investors may have different risk appetites. And if there is an event like like you described. Uh, a hedge fund could be, um, could be kind of uh, drawn into, into a very unfortunate situation by only um, a relatively small part of its, um, of its uh, capital base, its investors, even though the majority may be uh, very comfortable, may, uh, may be able to stomach the risk, as long as there is a um, small but um, kind of large enough constituency that would like to, to draw the capital, the hedge fund would, like, would need to... Um, would need to realize losses, would need to, uh, to sell asset, and can go into some kind of a, um, of a loop. In that sense, um, some hedge funds are creating separate buckets for different types of investors with different horizons, so that they can separate those that have longer horizons and are able to stomach um, less liquidity and maybe more risk than those that uh, are looking for uh, more liquid, uh, less risky, or more, uh, more ability to access the capital quickly and therefore by differentiating among, among their constituency, increase the, um, their ability to, to, to generate alpha by trading accordingly. And in case we have any hedge funds here that are in the midst of fundraising, I'm curious for our two allocators, what are some of the biggest mistakes hedge fund managers make when they approach you, when they're pitching their funds to you? Um, what, what are some missteps that you might often see? Lessons learned. I think, um, some of the things are, uh, you don't have to be everything to everybody, so certainly stick with your area of expertise is very important because uh, you're very good at that area, focus on that area. It's, I think the hard part is when people try to do everything, when they try to say, you know, we're directional, we're also relative value, we're discretionary, we're systematic. Even if they're a jack of all trades, the fear is that they're a master of none. So I say stick to your expertise. The other thing, I'd say is uh, know your audience because you're going to be talking to investors across the entire spectrum, and uh, you know you have to do your homework, you know, before you meet them, and just certainly know know what their motivation is, know what their utility function is, uh, know what they invest in, and uh, you know you'll be addressing your pitch appropriately because you'll be talking with some people that are you know very knowledgeable in your field, and you have some people that need to be educated on that. So. I think that's key. Is uh, it's not the same pitch to everybody. It's uh, know your audience. You know, I I can imagine a world where, in 2020, you know, for a number of reasons, we have an equity market sell-off. Call it down 20 for the year. Imagine that will be the first significant sell-off we have. You know, we had it in the fourth quarter of 2008, but it was hidden within a with, within a stronger year, um, and the rally came back so strongly. But imagine if it happens over a calendar year. And we have hedge funds do what we think they can do. They're going to be positive, call it in the 3 to 6% aggregate return range. And imagine that, a 25-point outperformance of hedge funds versus these broader indices, the passive indices. That will be a reminder of what they were supposed to do all along and they haven't done over all these years. So I think my advice would be to stay true to your strategy. Um, and it's very, it's a, it's an incredibly challenging asset rising environment right now. So I think um, hunker down and make the performance, and if you build it, they will come. <laughs> well, on that note, that was a really interesting panel. Thank you so much for joining us. We have Chris Solars from Cliffwater, Jackie Rosner from Pamco Christmas, <laughs> and Eric Bender from Barclays. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.